So welcome everyone to this uh, Sussex Development Lecture, uh, which um, uh, today the focus of this lecture is uh, the SDGs and the Global Education Agenda, Promises and Possibilities. Um, my name is Mario Novelli, I'm the Director of the Centre for International Education, and uh, today's lecture will be Professor Yusuf uh, Said. Um, just before I give a slight introduction uh, to his talk, I uh, just want to say that this lecture is also being recorded and broadcast live, so there are apparently 60 people signed up to, um, to participate virtually, uh, so they will also have a possibility to ask questions as well in the uh, question time. Uh, Yusuf will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we will open it up to questions uh, from the audience and feedback from Yusuf. Um, just as a brief introduction, uh, since I've been in Sussex since 2010, uh, uh, Professor Yusuf Said, who's a professor of international comparative education, um, has been working on a range of issues related to the SDGs and was involved in the uh, production of the uh, definition of the SDG for education and was contracted by the United Nations to carry out consultations with a range of stakeholders. So Yusuf was one of the few people that's actually accompanied this process uh, over the last years and uh, in, in, in the last couple of years uh, slightly switched topics and has moved much more focus on teachers uh, and peace building. Uh, but this lecture, he told me just before we started, has forced him to go back to all that literature and recap. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to this lecture. I think it's going to be both informative but also hopefully critical and raising awareness of some of the limitations of both the SDGs but also how far education has come in that process. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Yusuf and I'll go and sit down over there so I can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you, Mario, and thank you all for coming. As I was telling Mario, it gave me a good chance to go back and reread some of the documents and notes, but also to update myself on the progress. And what I, this talk is based on a paper that Kate and I are doing on SDGs in which we trace the process. We look at the framework, we look at the uh, we look at the orientations of the SDGs and a critique of it, but what we add to it, what I'm adding to in today's lecture is to track the progress and ask myself the one question which I think is at the top of everybody's mind. Will we achieve the SDGs by 2030? And I think as a way of summarizing the argument before I run out of slides and time, I think we're not going to achieve the SDGs unless there's a substantive shift and a major shift in how we do business around the SDGs. So in, I won't read the whole paper, so I'm going to flip through the slides. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about the idea of global goals. And I'm glad Richard is around because we, I'd, we draw on some of his work around global goal setting. The second part, I'm going to just talk through how the architecture and the paradigm of development is framed in the SDG agenda. And then I'll selectively look through one or two of the targets as it relates to education in order to ask ourselves the question at two levels. What kind of conception of education underpins the framing of the SDG targets in education? And what is the progress that we currently are making towards achieving some, if not all, of those SDG targets? I'll end off with a reflection using the work of various organizations, but principally the latest report by the UN General Secretary in which he delivered to the UN General Assembly on the state of progress towards the SDGs as a way of reflecting on where we're going. So that's a run through what this talk is covering. Now, the SDGs are part of a framing of development which stretches as far back for those in education jumped here in 1980 and certainly beyond that, where the idea was you govern 
the achievement of development through global goal setting. And the difference between the SDGs, MDGs, and Jamtian targets and many others is that they're rooted in an idea of governance in which you set global goals as a way of driving the actions not just of national govern governments, but also international actors and agency. And the argument is this governance model is based on the moral and persuasive power of goals and not legal powers. And this is important to mention about the SDGs in particular. They don't have technically any legal standing. They are moral and persuasive target setting. So what they operate on is a theoretical understanding of global governance through goal setting. And the adherence to goals is largely driven by the power of overseas development assistance. In other words, what occurs is that the goal setting is triggers of the formation and, and provision of aid. However, the SDGs, and this is an important point, is largely detached from current international legal treaties. There are strong international legal treaties around most aspects of the SDGs, but the SDGs as a framework is anchored within them but stands outside of them. So one issue conceptually to understand is that the goals are located within weak institutional arrangements at the intergovernment governmental level because both of their breadth, their depth, and their scope. Unlike the MDGs, they require far more intergovernmental co collaboration and networking across not just international agencies, but across national governments. However, therefore, it has left many writers to talk about the institutional oversight of the SDG implementation at the global level is rather not very clear and is very weak. Though there are bodies that the UN has set up to provide an oversight. The theory behind SDGs is that it's meant to provide a consensus seeking, country driven partnership of mod a model of development. And I put that as a question because although it's the assumption of the SDGs, I'm not sure if what we have is sufficient consensus, particularly when it comes to indicators and whether we got to the stage in the process where it's genuinely a country-driven partnership model of development. So just that's a quick run through of the theoretical framing of the paper we're developing. Now, Richard Jolly did the work for me on this one. He spoke about global goal setting of the United Nations, that over a 40-year period, there were more than 50 div different goals, including for education, but the biggest shift in global goal setting occurs in around 2000. And that's partly driven by at that time an emerging discourse of results for development, where educational goals become a lot more focused with specific targets to measure and track progress. From the time of the EFA goals and the MDGs, the development paradigm shifts to a results-based management and results-based development framework in which global targets that are set become a lot more specific, a lot more measurable, and an attempt to make that more concrete and more specific. Now, in terms of the SDGs themselves, uh, I'm going to just quickly talk about the processes. Unlike the MDGs or even any other global process prior to the SDGs, this was perhaps arguably the most extensive process of consultation. And in it were two, what uh, Kate in her work calls two parallel but interrelated tracks of framing uh, the SDG targets in education. The first were consultations around what is the conception of development that underpins the SDGs. These were largely initially UNDP-led consultation, initially initiated by by the Secretary General. And unlike the previous goal, global goal setting exercise, this incorporated spaces for what was arguably, and I deliberately emphasize arguably, citizen participation or more extensive forms of participation. The one form of participation in the SDG process that was leveraged was the idea of a common vote. 
for what are the development priorities. And many people part participated in the UNDP World Survey on the common goals. And in it is a story, but I'll skip the story now, but one of the votes that was most common, health and education, always appeared at the top of the agenda when people were asked to vote as to what is their most common development priority. At the same time, it was driven by the Open Working Group for Sustainable Development. This has its history back to Rio earlier. I think it's Rio 20, I, I can't remember now, but the Rio Consultations on the Environment. And the Open Working Group then drove the process. And it was one of the few processes of the Open Working Group that drove an argument that it should be led around issues of the environment and not just about the social sectors and economic growth as the previous iterations of goals were. Education had a slightly different but parallel process. And on that slide there, there are the various processes we, I mentioned there. In the paper, we talk more about thematic consultations, the global education meeting in Dhaka in 2013, which led to a UNESCO, UNICEF global meeting in Muscat in around 2015, ending up with the World Education Forum in Incheon in Korea in 2015. That was just before the UN General Assembly met in September 2015. And that Incheon meeting basically consolidated the framework of the education goals. And with it was attached probably the most significant document, which often it doesn't get read, which is the framework for action. The framework for action was a specification of the goals. Now, in terms of the processes itself, there's several things to mention about the processes. And this is based on the paper that we're working on. One is, arguably, there's been a lot of discussion that the SDG process, while in comparison, far more participatory in nature, was largely driven by elites. That it was elites within international organization and arguably elites within the global south. Elites of large civil society organizations or NGOs. And the second criticism of the process was, and Kenneth King and Robin Palmer summed up the critique by talking about the SDG processes as a northern tsunami and a southern drizzle or a weak discussion. I can't remember his analogy. But the argument that this was largely a globally north-driven process, it, did, it mattered more for elites in the north and international organizations in the north. But what is critical, a point I'll come to later, is what occurred in the SDG process was contestations over priorities and what is to be included, but crucially, what is to be kept out. And what you end up with, as I'll argue later when I look at specific targets, is some targets that just don't make sense in many respects, for which we still, three years later, don't have any measures of yet that we can agree on. And this is partly because there wasn't, there was a difficulty of reaching a compromise of what to put into the 10 education targets, what to keep out. But what was quite prominent in the SDG policy pro formulation process in general, but specifically in education was contestation over international aid, between international agencies. The question that kept being recurring in different ways, who was to lead the education global agenda and who was to lead it in the future? And there were three agencies both collaborating, but also in different ways contesting with each other over that. The three were the World Bank, UNESCO, and UNICEF in particular. And you can ask me later on in question time some of the dynamics of this. What then occurs as I'll show later, is the kind of policy we have around the SDG process is one of a compromise. Some critiques go so far as to suggest it's in many ways, it's essentially some targets are a fudge, uh, by which they mean that they kind of the compromise wasn't as suitably 
consensually agreed as it could have been. So with the process, I'm now going to talk about the development framework and paradigm. And I want to make three points about the development framework and paradigm. The framework of development that drove the SDGs was rooted in a critique and an understanding of, of the MDGs in particular. The MDGs, while many critique it, and so do I, for its narrowness, its reductionism, they also had surprising effects. They were more effective than anyone expected to in gaining traction as a dominant discourse of development. This is a quote from Fukada Pa. The effects, however, were not all benign. The SDGs reversed the process to some extent of the simplicity of the targets of the MDGs. In simple terms, you move from eight to 17. In education, you move to 10 targets within one goal. And in that sense, the SDGs are a politically negotiated con consensus that at one level has no enforcement mechanism built in. But that is its weakness, but also its strength. Because looking forward, the onus, the onus falls on civil society groups to leverage the SDGs as a cause correction by putting pressures on governments and their powerful actors to account for the commitments made. So while on one hand, as a politically negotiated consensus or compromise, they don't have strong enforcement mechanisms, they do have leverage in terms of what it affords uh, civil society groups and other actors to hold governments and international actors to account. The paradigm that, uh, that underpins the SDGs in general Jeffrey Sachs spoke about in already in his Lancet article in 2012. He spoke about the triple bottom line of development. And in, to summarize his triple bottom line of development or to rephrase it, he spoke about the three global imperatives going forward. One had to do with issues of the environment. The second had to do issues about economic growth, but inclusive economic growth in particular. And the third had to be to deal with the social pillars of development, which is things like education, health, et cetera. And in a sense, the one stretch the SDGs make generally, but also in education in specifically, they stretch the canvas of ambition from not only social pillars, but also taking more seriously the changing global realities around environment and the economy. But the key questions you have to ask is, what does the SDGs attempt to achieve? What is operationalized in its achievement? Who is responsible for its achievement? How is it measured? Now, I'm not going to try to answer all those questions, but it's certainly at the back of our minds, to keep at the back of our minds, those are the critical questions when confronted with an ambitious agenda. But the SDGs, when you read them carefully, also have different levels of interaction. And in question time, you can ask me more about this. But Beeman's talks about at one level, some of the SDGs actually facilitate uh, the achievement of each other. They have strong interaction effects, positive interaction effects. Education and health, for example. Education and inequality has strong interaction. Others actually constrain and hinder each other. They're actually contradictory when you go through it. So when you get down to targets like goal number 17 or goals around inequality or goals around the economy, some of those targets and indicators that measures actually put a break on some of the social pillars of development that one wants to hold to or the environmental concerns that drives the SDGs. But it is these three pillars which were summed up in the framing document of the SDGs called the 5P model of development. It, in other words, the SDG agenda is about people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. Those are the five drivers and conceptualization that drove the SDG process. And in a sense, this is taken a direct extract from the opening text of 
the final SDG document that was agreed. Now, these are just now, I'll give you some background around the details of the SDGs. These are the 17 sustainable development goals, ranging from poverty on the one hand to partnerships as goal number 17. Um, one of the things to just think about the goals, and as an aside, in the paper we talk more about it, some of them have different breadths of ambition and scope. Poverty is about categorical, it's about ending extreme poverty. Inequality gets fudged as to the reduction of inequality over time. And so poverty gets great attraction in terms of its eradication, and inequality gets less attraction in our analysis because it's about reduction of inequality. And the point about the two is the interaction effects between poverty and inequality is as follows. Tony talks about, Richard Tony talks about that the problem is not poverty, the problem is inequality. Poverty is simply the unacceptable face of inequality argues. So in a sense, if the, the long-term sustainable way of ending all forms of poverty is to mitigate or eradicate inequalities in between and within societies. The SDGs are a huge agenda. I've just summarized for you here. The architecture is built around each goal having targets and each goal having means of implementation. MOI stands for means of implementation. In terms of scales, you're talking about 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 indicators, 244 if you include repeats. So that's globally we are trying to track 232 indicators. In total that roughly breaks down depending how you count, 125 targets across 17 sustainable development plus 44 means of implementation. Means of implementation are simply what are argued to be the conditions that are required to achieve each of the targets in each of the goals. Now, Bertram et al. talks about means of implementation as imperfectly conceptualized and inconsistently formulated. In simple terms, one way of reading them, some means of implementations, when you read them carefully, are actually should actually have been to the status of targets. In education, teachers one teacher's means of implementation is one of them, as I'll show later. At least half of the target's goals reflect a focus on the planet and, and the environment, whether it's about life on land, life below the sea, whether it's about sustainable uh, tackling climate change, they're all in different ways deal with issues of the planet and environment. So clearly one of the outcomes of the SDG process and the deliberations of the open working group was a stronger focus on the environment and issues to do with climate change. Here I just gave you all the education targets and every indicator attached to it, and I'll come back to it uh, in later time. But what I want to focus on, I'm only going to talk about three of those targets to illustrate the point I'm making about the conceptualization of education in these targets and what I would argue is the weak framing of some of the targets and indicators. In terms of indicators, this is the punchline. This is the latest 4th April 2019 report on indicators. Indicators for measuring progress are classified at three tiers, one, two, and three. A tier one indicator is a good indicator because it's conceptually clear, it has an internationally established methodology, and you can get data from it from country. As you go down the list, the third one is no internationally established methodologies or standards yet available, and very little, therefore no data can be collected. Of the number of 232 I mentioned, 
only 101 of those indicators are tier one indicators. That means that we're measuring just under half at the level we should be measuring. This is 4th April 2019. So three and a half years in process, we're only at the stage where we can measure about half of that which we're going to measure. So if people ask me whether you're gonna achieve the SDGs or not, partly my answer is it depends on which indicator you're using and whether you have the means to measure it in the first place. The indicator framework is also complicated because what I've just spoken about in this slide are global indicators. But global indicators are also go down three levels. The next level they go down to is thematic. In education, there are 43 plus thematic indicators for education. And then there are regional indicators that monitor regionally relevant education issues. For example, the African Union 2063 Global uh, African Union Agenda has other indicators. And then they drill down to the national level. So what you can see is emerging with the SDG process, a process that actually one can track as far back as 2000, is this idea of results-based management and development indicator measurement becoming stronger, becoming more assertive, and as the ambition grows, so does the demand for data, and so does the demand for measuring progress grows. Now, the SDG process was a contested one. In this slide and in the paper we speak more about, we talk about how over time that the SDG goal has shifted, and in fact, from its first iteration to its last. Different groups play different roles in arguing it. In fact, if you look at the goal itself, the inclusive, the idea of the overarching goal as inclusive education as well gets added in at the very last minute of deliberation. So it was just before Inchen some words is. But the second thing about uh, the SDG process is how the overarching goal is constructed linguistically. If you read it very carefully, the overarching goal, the first part talks about, begins with the word a verb ensure, and the second part begins with the word promote. There's an imperative to the achievement of the first part. There's a reticence about the achievement of the second part. Because the second part, is about lifelong learning. And when you read the targets, the commitment to lifelong learning, when you read each target and indicator, ends almost at the end of lower secondary education. It doesn't go a lot further in many respects, even though the language incorporates in the targets are going further, it doesn't incorporate going much further than secondary education. In fact, the key extension of the SDGs, I, we argue, and I would argue, is that it doesn't go beyond basic education still. The notion of lifelong e in the target was an important addition. It was used to signal two different things. Lifelong was a play of words in the construction of language. It was meant to signal, on the one hand, all levels of education, but as I argue, not all levels. On the other hand, it was meant to encompass a concern with the older issues in the MDGs around literacy as well. But the, the overarching goal itself is tautological. In other words, it's, it's, it has certain words that repeat themselves. You can't have a lifelong learning for all and equitable because by definition, if it's equitable, it must encompass for all. Right? You can't talk about equitable and inclusive at the same time because technically if you genuinely have an inclusive education, it is equitable by definition. But the construction of it was carefully thought about. And in fact, there was a big debate in the process about whether the word equitable should be retained or not in favor of the word inclusive. The construction of tautological was a compromise to suggest that one of the key things of the SDGs unlike the M MDGs, is the word equitable was used to ideologically denote 
a commitment to an agenda that wasn't only about the global south. It was also about the global north. Because if you focus on poverty, as the previous uh, development framework did, then you look, your gaze is towards the global south. If you begin to focus on inequality as an overarching goal and something you're trying to, the gaze has to be the global north because inequalities within countries are growing. And therefore, it's imperative that countries like UK, US measure their progress if inequality is a focus and not simply poverty. Um, but one of the key things about the SDGs was the fact that in education was a strong focus of learning. It's not, co I would argue, right, and I must be careful, it's not coincidental that following the SDGs or at about the same time the SDGs are being constructed, two major reports come out. One from the World Bank called Learning the, to Realize Education's Promise. It's the World Development Report. Simultaneously or in parallel, DFID releases its education policy position paper. Again, it puts Get Children Learning at the heart of its focus. So one of the big shifts that occurred around the debates around the SDGs and the formulation of the SDGs was a focus on learning. It was almost an important corrective to an earlier focus on physical ex ex access at the expense of quality. But what occurs in the debate, as I'll show just now, is that education quality gets narrowly reduced to a very narrow vision of learning, which gives me a good space to begin to talk about three of those goals. First, the learning, 4.1. Tier, and this indicator, interestingly, is classified mainly at tier one and to an extent at two, tier two. Underlying this goal is the target, which says by 2030, ensure that all girls and boys complete free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education, leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. But nowhere in the SDGs is the idea of relevance and effective, qualified, explained, clarified. The only time it gets clarified is in the indicators, which I'll show just now. Because what the indicators talk about is only measuring learning in literacy and numeracy primarily. So the idea of what is relevant and effective is cognitive attainment in literacy and numeracy at the end of primary and at the end of lower secondary. So what, be, what it then begins to do at the level of the indicators, it begins to provide a very narrow definition of learning, which is summed up in that one, right? And here's a quote in the paper we use. We can only have one global indicator for 4.1. It's going to be reading and maths as OECD would like it to be for the end of lower secondary, because that is what they measure. So even though the target talks about learning, even narrowly constructed at end of secondary education, the indicator only measures learning at the end of lower secondary. And so now I'll just, and in fact, this idea of learning is very interesting in the SDGs because if you read the SDGs in conjunction with the World Development Report of the World Bank and DFID, what you get is a vision of learning that goes something like this. These are direct quotes from the World ba Development Report. It basically says there's too little, little measurement of learning, not too much. In other words, you need to measure learning. So what learning gets reduced to is measurement and cognitive attainment. And it's driven by a strap line of a notion of change and a theory of change, which simply goes by the statement, what gets measured gets managed. Or in my words, what gets measured gets done. Right? There's an argument that if you measure it, it's going to take into account. It's going to happen. 
So in summary, the critique of the SDGs, particularly around 4.1, 4 but generally across all of the targets, what you have is a very narrow view of learning, framed within a very strong, what one would arguably say is a neoliberal discourse of why learning matters. Learning matters because it's about economic growth or narrow constructions of economic growth. It doesn't engage with any notions of quality of learning which is beyond literacy and numeracy. Not that this is unimportant, just so that I'm clear about it. And more importantly, the idea of learning that drives the uh, education SDGs is that measuring learning is seen as the main solution to all problems associated with providing access to marginalized children to have quality education. And so systematic testing as a global phenomenon of large-scale international tests like TIMS PISA. And recently, the OECD are piloting an, uh, a test for school levels because the PISA test is national. OECD are beginning to develop and pilot a test for school level international measures. Robin Alexandra puts it nicely. He says that education for the period 2015 needs a radical and properly informed debate about indicators and measures in relation to the black box or black hole of teaching and learning. For classrooms are the true front line in the quest for educational quality. The proper sequence, surely, is not to make do with the odd measure that happens to have featured in a number of school effectiveness studies, but to start with a rounded account of the educational process and the purposes it serves, the re then range comprehensively and eclectically across the full spectrum of research. And he goes on. It's basically quite a powerful and trenchant critique of how educational quality learning and its measures in the SDGs are framed. This is the data. And interestingly, there's very few countries that have data on even the simple measures of reading proficiency. Most of the data we have, and this is from the UN SDG tracker, they have a very helpful tool online for those who are interested. The SDG Tracker tool has a lot of data on primary and, it, and many countries. But if you see the next slide, the only country it has data on minimum proficiency in maths in Africa is Ghana. Right? It has very other few, and South Africa to an uh, very few other countries that has data on the end of secondary education for comparable. So the three countries, Botswana, South Africa, and Ghana are the ones that I've identified. But again, you can see that if you look at the projection, this was the data at the end of 2017. Ghana's prof um, achievement in mathematics proficiency in 2015, so the data comes up in 2016, is 22%. Clearly from there, in the next 12 years or 11 years, to get from there to a range like Germany is going to be quite a huge jump and gap to make. S similarly, when you calculate the measures of indicators for the mean years of schooling for children across all education for the population age 15 to 64, you'll see what emerges from the data of the SDGs is three groupings of countries, if you like. This is obviously, we don't have all the data, so I've grouped them based on the data. The first grouping of countries, if you like, uh, you, one could arguably say are Canada, UK, Denmark, where the mean years of schooling are much higher in the range of around 11, 12, the second grouping are countries like South Africa, Colombia, where the mean range is in the range of about seven to 10, closer, getting closer to 10 in some countries. And then there's a third group of countries where the mean range of uh, years of schooling is in, the, is in the range of as low as about 2.5 years uh, at all education levels in Sudan, for example, to Pakistan. If you then look similarly at life expectancy in secondary education, 
uh, for males and females in 2014, you see the same pattern occur. School life expectancy is the life expectancy a male or female girl, or, uh, a male or female school age going secondary child can expect. If you're down at the lower end, you get a grouping of countries of Burkina Faso, Mozambique, Lesotho, Mali, Pakistan, where the, where the school life expectancy in secondary is less than four. Then you have the range at the top where the school life expectancy is closer to 10, somewhere between eight and 10. And then you have a range of countries, and South Africa kind of stands as an outlier in many respects, which is closer to around six years. And obviously within each country, the life expectancy differs for males and females as well in terms of secondary education. And the two are obviously related. The mean years of schooling and the life expectancy of males and females are obviously linked in these two graphs. The next goal I want to deconstruct a bit is 4.7. This was meant to be the significant addition that broke with development thinking around education. It was meant to be the target that expressed all those values of education that weren't simply to do with attainment, literacy, and numeracy. It's a target that's a mouthful, because if you read it out, it says all learners acquired the skills and knowledge to promote sustainable development, including amongst others through ESD, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, citizenship, cultural diversity. It clearly is an advance. And in the paper, we do acknowledge that this is an advance. But by lumping together such a large group of themes in target 4.7, make this target seem too complex, and as such risk it being deprioritized by governments. Just one of the policy people who was talking about that said, it's too broad, too many concepts, difficult for people to grasp. Everybody wanted to have their say in this target, and everybody did get their say, as you can see, right? Because you got just about everything. The other target, by the way, similar to this, is target 4.5, because on gender in SDG, because that talks about gender equality, but it also talks about discrimination. 4.7 and 4.5, many of the targets are actually, if you read them carefully, they're written in almost two parts. They're meant to talk about something that starts off as the core priority, like 4.5 on gender, and ends up by talking about all forms of discrimination. In fact, interestingly, very few of the targets and indicators are disaggregated in terms of indicators of equity. Now, this target is classified as tier three. It's a target that says it's conceptually not clear, no established international methodology, and it's hard to. And this is what you'll find on the SDG tracker when you look for data on this target. Strapline, we are currently not aware of data for this indicator. You can notify us of available the data for this indicator via our feedback form. So this is what was presented as the 2018 report on progress. This is what the SDG target tracker says. It's the one where, where as I argued, if there's no agreed indicator that's clear and measurable, and it proves the World Bank right to an extent, it doesn't get done. It's the one that's hard to measure. In fact, it's quite narrow, right? Because its definition is quite narrow. Indicator 4.1 is the extent to which global citizenship education and ESD is mainstream at all levels in national education policies, curricula, teacher education, and student assessment. Just think of that indicator. For those who do indicator work, you'd struggle to make sense of that because not only does it not match the target itself, it's also just virtually impossible to operationalize at some level as well. Teachers 
are the third target I want to look at. Teachers are not listed as the targets because targets have uh, the, the way the SDGs are formulated, targets are numbered, 4.1, 4.2. Means of implementation, they use the alphabets. So you have 4A, 4B, 4C. Teachers are under means of implementation and they're classified as 4B. And it says, this is one of the few targets, uh, and if you want to be technically precise, few means of implementation that's not meant to be achieved by 2030, but meant to be achieved by 2020. It substantially expands globally the number of scholarships available to developing countries, in particular least developing countries. One of the first few targets in education, but across all SDG targets, to talk about small island developing states, and then it adds, and African countries. Some of scholarships are specifically targeted at African countries. For enrollment in higher education, including vocational training and information technology, technical engineering and scientific programs in developed countries and other developing countries. So the, this target around scholarships and teachers, right, which I'll come to now, the teacher target I'll come to now, this target about teachers and scholarship. Scholarships are meant to drive the intake of teachers in particular as well, right? But the scholarships target was meant as a means of implementation, arguably to achieve all those other S seven targets of the SDGs, but crucially the scholarship target was meant to be an agreement with African countries in particular who wanted a focus on higher education. So for many, this was the higher education targets. Sorry, the teacher target I took out of here, but the teacher target is simply increasing, which is 4C, is increasing the number of teachers who are qualified. The thing about the teacher target and the scholarship target both were subject to immense resistance. They were not meant to be included. The teacher target was added at the very last minute, which is 4C. And it only focuses on qualification and less on the other aspect of teacher's work, such as working conditions, motivation, and crucially, practice. Right? Differed, in fact, when you read the target on teachers and scholarships, differed goes further. It says that what you need to do is tackle the fundamental change of teacher performance. So DFID takes the discussion of teacher, teachers and their work in a more instrumental way than even the SDGs uh, intended to do by talking about teacher performance, which is a short step, as EI would point out, around teacher testing. So, is this teacher target anyway, both quantitatively and qualitatively, likely to be achieved? If you look at all the data, the chances are very unlikely. You'd need 68 million teachers to be recruited by 2030. Right? Six, so that means in the period of 12 years, you'd need something like 68 million teachers. You need 20 million of those teachers for new classrooms in secondary and you'd need a replacement stock of about 48 million. So when you look at the teacher targets, both at the level of an, new classrooms is a measure of the increase in student enrollments and also replacement. When you look at this teacher target, if those who are familiar with teacher education know that if you take two to three years to train a teacher, you can imagine the scale of teacher education you have to do. I'll skip some of this, but this is the data from the SDG tracker. As you go from the right-hand side of your slide to the big picture I have in the middle, you'll see that as you get up to secondary and upper secondary, the number of qualified teachers dramatically declines. That is one of the, ironically, the successes of the MDGs and the EFA goals was an increase in primary teachers. But the challenge now is to increase the number of teachers for lower secondary and secondary. So where does this leave us? One, I think what, as a way of assessing the SDGs, 
first you have a big data problem, right? Because not only do we have not not only we don't have the indicators agreed to measure it, we just don't have the data. And the trajectory right now, and this is of serious concern, the development of the measures and indicators is done as a technical exercise and not as a political exercise. Because in other words, it stands outside the purview of public discourse and public consultation. And in fact, because what gets measured gets done, logic underpinning it, it is crucial that we have a public debate ab around that. And in fact, what is this challenge right now as we look forward to the next few years of the SDGs, we have two views. We have the view of the Education Commission, which as you know is Brown Foundation, where to get galvanize attention globally, a single global indicator of learning should be agreed to complement national measures of learning. This is almost like the mythical holy grail. So will we achieve it? I'll skip the silences. Will we achieve it? Well, let me give you, uh, this is UK. This is the data on UK. Out of 143 relevant targets, UK is only performing well on 24% of those was 50% where their gaps in policy coverage or performance is not adequate, and 15% where there is little or no policy. The reason I'm going to the Global North is to show if UK can't achieve it, the chances of measuring up other countries are lower. This is the sober reality of the UN General Secretary General re Report. However, the report also shows, and this is being very cautious, in some areas, progress is insufficient to meet the agenda's goals and targets by 2030. So instead of me telling you whether they will achieve it, I'm giving you two views on whether, what are the prospects of achieving it. So the latest, most recent 2018 report is already beginning to raise the warning bells about the achievement of the SDGs, let alone the agreement of that 100 or so indicators which are not yet agreed or not yet measured. So I think if we are generally committed to the idea of equitable and quality lifelong learning, there are various conditions that need to be set. One of the conditions is developing those indicators and targets in ways that provide a holistic, reflexive, and critical vision of education. We also need an approach to education, financing, and accountability, which privileges the new needs of the poor and marginalized through quality basic uh, public education. And it requires clear and robust in indicators if the agenda seeks to hold all to account. Otherwise, I suspect we're setting ourselves yet up for an agenda which will remain illusory and unattainable, not unlike the MDGs. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we now have uh, plenty of time for questions, comments, reflections. Um, I think what, I'll, what I suggest is I'll, I'll, I'll collect a number of questions and then give uh, Yusuf the chance to respond to them and then we'll go for another round until we've finished. So if you just want to raise your hands, I can see a lady at the back there. Uh, I'll take three, uh, three questions and then we'll uh, feedback. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about international bodies being debate drivers in, in you know, the whole education perspective and um, formulating policies on a global level that, of course, you have to um, disseminate at some point to a national level. Like, do you think um, it does help in any way? And does this kind of question the um, you know, some sort of legitimacy problem on a state level where you have international bodies creating policies for them that may or may, may not work for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question? Comment? Kwame at the back. Uh, thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I think I, I heard you say something about the 
the construction of the SDGs as something that driven uh, pre predominantly from the global north. Will I be right in saying that a lot of what is being done and is being used uh, is really um, what we don't know about is actually the people who actually put this thing together and the extent to which they, 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 they sidelined <coughs> uh, uh, the global south uh, and that this is actually a tool for, for, for the global north and not for the global south. Um, when I go to Ghana, I go to other, nobody cares about it. Anytime politicians talk about SDGs, they are talking about, they use it in a platform which makes them come across as participating in a global discourse. But if you go down to the ground, they don't care about it. And I'm just wondering whether this is actually something that is driven and interested, it's the World Bank and others use it for their own you know, the, 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 uh, 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 objectives. I'll take both questions, yeah. My question is slightly related to that. I, I'm from the Global North, Kwame. And uh, if, if, we, if the public successively see goals failing, there's nothing worse than seeing a goal, goals, global goals fail. You know, if the MDGs didn't achieve what they set out to do, and then the Sustainable Development Goals don't achieve that, then the, the public becomes cynical. Uh, in their support of any kind of development in the South. So post-2030, I know I'm jumping ahead here when we'll be retired and enjoying the sunshine. Um, is it just going to be that people just won't believe any kind of goals that the UN and the World Bank then come up with because they just say, well, in my lifetime, every goal they've ever set, they've failed to achieve? Um, thanks, Yusuf. That was really depressing. Um, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm not blaming you. Um, I'm just wondering then where you kind of left it, what that means we need to do now in terms of, you know, is there an opportunity to revisit any of those indicators before we miss them? Should we just take your last question and then before Yusuf, because many of them are connected, yeah. Hi, yeah, I'm Joe Howard, IDS. Um, two things. One is um, I'm thinking about how education is actually cross-cutting. And the SDGs, for me, the most critically valuable thing that, that is about how they join up. And you did talk about the trade-offs between the goals. But education is fundamentally central to every single one of them. So what's your reflection on that rather than the, the pillar of education as one of the goals and the second question is about well you've you've referred quite frequently to the the narrow vision of education and talked about the need for a holistic and so on um, so what about informal education and how, what are the other processes that are contributing to this education um, and maybe contributing to those unattainable uh, level three uh, indicators thank you okay so I'll give you a chance to respond and then we can go. Okay, all right. Uh, I think a lot of them are very helpful comments um, and questions. Let me, look, I mean, at one level, I often think that it's a question of, I gave a very critical reading of the SDGs, but that doesn't mean I don't see the value of global goal setting. Because I think the MDGs did help, and there were positive features. And I think the SDGs do help, in very some, some ways positively. I think for the first time, one could read it as it, in education specifically. It does put on the table the discussion of a vision of education that is broader, even though it's very weakly conceptualized, poorly measured, unlikely to be achieved, right? but it is shifting the debate on. And so for me, the answer to some of the questions is to say that like any policy, the answer is not gonna be found in the boardrooms and the rooms of international agencies. It's gonna be found around the struggles of civil society organizations and social movements to hold governments to account, 
because, in a sense, but, and yes, I, and in that sense, I think it does have merit, but I also agree with the other part of it, which is what Kwame is saying. I, I think you're right. I mean, if you go to any country, there's very few people who actually know the SDGs. You know, if you had to do a survey as in at the local level, right? Uh, not having said that, I read a report of the South African government where they were talking about the attainment of the SDGs, which I thought was heartwarming, that they actually are beginning to engage with the debate because it's forcing them to engage with the debate where issues about target 4.7 matters to South Africa, even if they don't use the language in the way that the goal may. So yes, I think, I don't think people get totally Rob, your question, totally cynical because we fail. Because in a sense, a sober assessment would say there are positive progress. And it's always a debate when you set targets. You know, targets by definition are at one level aspirational. Mm -hmm. The question is how aspirational do you want to be? Do you want to set yourself up to make it so aspirational as to set yourself up to fail? What is the proper calibration of that process where you set a target that is stretching on the one hand but achievable on the other? I don't know if there's an easy answer to that, which also then answers the question. I think there's still a lot to play for in terms of the indicators. I think some of the indicators are unresolved, unclear, can be developed. So I think there's still a lot to play for. I didn't speak about it a lot in response to the other set of questions. Yes, I think one of the things is I would argue that education is probably one of the few goals that cuts across most other, if not all goals. There's an argument of where they're all, but certainly across all the goals it makes a big difference because having every child educated with quality will make a difference to how you understand tackling climate change, et cetera, because education provides a broad knowledge, skills, and dispositions to tackle many of those things. And there are correlation effects, you know. Uh, people are healthier, also more educated. So there's a correlation between education and health, for example. So I think the one thing that I, the SDGs push harder on than perhaps the MDGs, but both said the same thing. The goals are meant to be read as indivisible and integrated. It's in the starting text of the transforming the world we won. Unfortunately, in this talk, I was just narrowing down on the education one. But I recognize it's indivisible and integral to each other. Although I do think some of those targets and goals just contradict each other. And we must, we must call them out because they just don't make sense because they, they go in opposite directions as well. Partly because the way the process was driven, which is back to Kwame's point, the process was each sector then drove its own target setting process. And so they didn't, it wasn't uh, indivisible and integrated at the point of formulation necessarily. Sectors and groups didn't speak to each other, which is that slide on process. And I think you're right, we need to talk more about informal, non-formal education, which the SDG education one is very weak on. It doesn't talk a lot about it. It, it kind of touches on it in a tangential way. So I guess in a qualified way I'm saying it matters because it is a set of goals that are going to make a difference. It's attached to results. It's going to be attached to funding. So whether you, whatever your stance on it is, it matters in very different ways, you know. And just in the most basic way, for researchers it matters. Every grant that's coming out from now for the next five years are talking about the SDGs in one way or another, right? So it has real, so I think while it's up there and it sounds abstract, for me it has significant practice and policy traction in the lives of people, whether they're aware of it or not, whether they, it's explicit or not, it matters in different ways.
Okay. Come on. We have another round of questions. Should you can begin? We've got one, yeah, two, I've three. Yeah, a question and some comments. My question is, how can or how do you expect the goals to be related to the great diversity? How, thanks. Question, how do you expect the goals to be related to the great diversity of country and local situations in all sorts of areas. If I'm allowed to, let me make two or three comments en route. Because I did look, as you kindly acknowledge, at every goal set by the UN since 1960. Incidentally, the first ones were all about education set by UNESCO regionally. And basically, there was only one goal 100% implemented. And you could even say, oh no. They said, WHO in 1966, they would eradicate smallpox in 10 years, the goal. It took 11 years. Mm -hmm. But what an achievement. You know, two million people were dying each year. Many of you won't remember, I can remember, because I had to have certificates to travel. Two million were dying a year from smallpox. And when smallpox was eradicated, <coughs> it was gone. Now, the point I'm making is that success is not 100%. It's got to be what acceleration, what improvements. And I hope the use of indicators will help that. Secondly, I think if you read just the summary, the goals are very idealistic. And even me as a goal person committed from experience to goals, they can sound very excessively idealistic. On the other hand, if you apply the test of progress, advance, and that's why I like very much what you were saying about Britain, um, not you know, missing most of the education goals. To me, that requires, as you were saying at the end, local action to mobilize and to hold. And we should hold the British government. The one thing they're really taking seriously, I think, is getting better, better reports on the progress. So when that comes out, I think later this year, we should really look at it and then write lots of letters and mobilize the Ministry of Education and so forth. Just one final thing, I went back to where I worked in Kenya 19, 60 years ago. I was amazed, I went to pay in Buringo district, I went to pay, pay a courtesy visit to the governor. He came out of a meeting, I said out of interest, what's your meeting? The SDGs. I then went up the, the road and there was a barraza, a little meeting by the side of the road, 150, 25 people. They were discussing the SDGs. Go to Lewis at Sussex, and they've been discussing the SDGs. I think there may be more action locally happening than people realize. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I should pass, but, but um, I found this very, very, um, uh, well, not pro provoking, but in a very positive sense, because of the things, the, the, uh, what you call the effective aspects, um, which were under promote rather than ensure, for instance. These are obviously very, very important across the world. And what I'm wondering is whether a different sort of approach from measured indicators is needed for those aspects, mm -hmm. and if so, what it might be and whether the form that it might take would be um, very decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer mm. between countries, mm. rather on the lines of the, the DAC mm. committee that used to meet, mm. in which um, countries in, in, in the OECD were called to account by their colleagues once a year, whether we need some different way of getting at the really, really important qualitative, which can also be diverse as between different contexts. Mm. So decentralization, peer-to-peer, um, -peer, mm. is there anything in that? Mm. 
thank you. Uh, yeah, very interesting. And um, there's, I want to have a look at what you were saying about teachers, and if you can clarify whether you were saying that both Alexandra and was it the Education Commission were saying that there should be a, a, a benchmark, a goal about what good teaching is. Mm. Okay. It was. I wasn't clear. Sure. Or, or a description. Sure. I mean, there have been an attempt at standards. Michelle Schweisberg has come up with those. And if those are going to be used, you know, they could be used well, they could be used to further beat um, teachers with. And just to say, I'm not quite as negative. It's only been four years. It, it, and I don't know whether that's something to consider. I can't remember what happened four years after the MDGs, whether people were saying the same thing. Okay. Any other uh, questions? We have a lady over there in the third row. Uh, firstly, I would like uh, to tell my opinion regarding the measurement part because uh, I think as well that maybe it is not the problem that the goals are not achieved, but there are issues regarding the measurement. That is why, as a result, we see that the goals are not achieved, but they can bring lots of changes, although the outcome, the final measurement, is not reached. In, this, in that sense, I'm positive as well. Uh, in my country, I have participated in the nationalization of the SDGs as I was involved in the working group. And during the education SDGs, we were um, challenged by the issue of the SDGs, very uh, of the goals targets being very specific because it was setting, for instance, development of the skills in IT or the uh, development of the technical education and the, I think in different country contexts this can be explained and accepted in a different way because as I'm from Armenia and it has a Soviet history the technical education was uh, accepted as a way back not as a way forward because by that time they were there were many uh, higher education institutions which were providing solely technical education and they were not being accepted as a good high education institutions with, which provide education in social science uh, or various science disciplines but solely technical so this confused a little bit our discussion I remember this very well because it took lots of time and I wanted to know your opinion if do you think that these kind of very specific things in the targets can cause these kind of uh, issues in terms of afterwards implementation. Because now I'm talking just about the discussions, but I'm sure that these problems will occur during the implementation as well. Thank you. Okay, do you want to respond? Oh, one more question. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, the SDG goals has a very narrow view of learning framed within a neoliberal dis uh, discourse. So I was wondering a very similar thing. Do you think that uh, it is promoting vocational and very technical education and undermining other liberal and language subjects which actually encourage the local knowledge? So is it affecting or kind of like is, is, is is poorly not in in a negative way affecting them, affecting the local, you know, the local mind of their own knowledge. Are we losing out on something because we are focusing a lot okay. on this? Okay. Okay. Over to you. Okay. All right. Many of these are comments, I guess. Um, I'll try to respond to some of them. I hope I can do it satisfactorily. I think the difficulty, Richard's right. You know, you want to set a target on the one hand that's global in scope and ambition, but at the same time want to ex recognize specificity and local context. And it's, it's a difficulty of doing that, you know, because, you know, how do you measure attainment even in maths, globally, that's globally comparable, right? Because we know that the number of countries that participate in TIMS and PISA is limited, right? 
PISA is mainly OECD countries with a few others. TIMS, not every country participates. So how would you determine a global measure? You know, And that's some of the challenges between trying to establish a global target with global measures on the one hand and dealing with specificity. I don't think I have an answer to that. I mean, there are different ways one can think around it. And one way to think around it, and this is the risk, is that you, you accept what a country measures as learning and you take that as the benchmark for learning instead of imposing or setting a, um, like some people argue, a PISA for development instead. That's one way of where you can balance the local with the global. That's one way of thinking about it. I also think uh, Robert's right. I think we need a different set of approaches. You know, let me just. I think it would be helpful just to show why I'm why we need a different approach. I just need to go back a bit because um, uh, uh, it's somewhere here. Um, yeah, the, you see, we need a different measure to measure the effective. What we have is quite narrow measures of the effective. And can we think of this not being a global measure, but probably being local or even regional? Because what citizenship, what human rights means may vary between regions or even within regions. So I think it's about if you're committed to the idea and the commitment to something beyond that, then I think it does make sense to think of other ways. The difficulty is that a global measure is meant to hold everybody to account. So can you reconcile holding everybody to account with accepting regional measures or even local measures? Because that's the risk you have. And I think maybe there is something around decentralization or peer-to-peer. -peer. I'm not sure. Um, I think the other questions, yeah, I mean, is it too early assess? Yeah, it's, it's, it's less than four years. It's closer to three years or three years and a bit. But I think it's important to assess the path already because there's a trajectory uh, in which you're going. And it's far more important to correct it at this point in order to have a clearer assessment. And in fact, one of the weaknesses of the global targets and global goal setting is that th there isn't a sufficient inbuilt, time-bound, short-term assessment periods to make sure that you don't reach right up until 2029 to determine whether you made it or not. So in a sense, I think, now's a good time as any to start asking questions because we are closer to a five-year interval than we to a 15-year interval. And I think it's right to ask at a closer to a five-year interval, is the trajectory going more or less in the right direction, even if we know 100% it's not achievable? But are we more or less on the right path? I'm saying I'm not sure yet. Partly I'm not sure yet because the indicators are not there and the data is not there. But where there is data and where there is indicator, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced. I look at Ghana and I look at South Africa and I think we've got a long road to go to have that, even the narrower measure of literacy and numeracy. The teacher target, Joe, is this one year. Uh, proportion of teachers in primary, lower secondary, up the secondary, right? But what the Education Commission is not talking of the teacher target. The Education Commission is talking about one single measure of learning. That's like almost like an index. You know, they want an index of <laughs> from all the indicators you create one single index. There's value in it. There's also disadvantages in it. Kwame probably will know as well as I do. The advantage of the Education Development Index of the GMR was that it had it was one single measure of progress. But that was its exact weakness. Because as a single composite indi indicator made, made up of multiple indicators, it depends what you put into it, right? 
So I'm a bit worried about that. Alexander is cautioning against that. He's basically arguing against the Education Commission's view of that single measure of learning. But I can see why people want it, because if you have a single measure, you get leaked tables. <laughs> if you get leaked tables, then things might or might not happen, right? So it's the trade-offs. I think the other questions about technical and vocation, the challenge of the SDGs is going to turn on implementation, how different countries take it on, and how it grafts onto the existing policies and practices of different countries. Because at one level, it's saying different things, but at another level, it's not saying anything that countries wouldn't do anyway, or should not be doing anyway, like technical and vocational education, etc. It's how you implement it, and that's the hard part. I think you're right, um, if I understood the last comment from Johari, you're right. Um, uh, you're right about the fact that once you measure something, you end up deprivileging other things. And there is a risk around deprivileging anything that's only a particular language or a particular uh, lit literacy or numeracy. There is that risk, and that's going to be a risk. But the other reading you can make of the SDGs is, and this is my view, a country that is forward-thinking and sensible would not write its policies simply on the basis of an SDGs. Because the SDGs is an, is an extraction of a number of targets. If you're running an education system, you're doing more than the seven SDGs or 10 SDGs. You're doing a lot more. So in a sense, it's about recognizing that as a country you're doing all of this, but you probably have to do more than that. So it's about the ownership of it, and it's also about how you explain and understand your work in relation to SDGs. The classic example that was given was India, SSA, and the MDGs, and EFA, where India simply, as a country, said our SSA program is our MDG program. That's it. It's our EFA program. So if you want it, that's what we do. right? And in a sense, it's an assertiveness of the local that needs to know more prominence to say, this is how we, at, in a decentralized or in a local way, take on these SDGs in terms of how we embed and bed them down. In other words, it's how we mediate these global gold setting in the very things we do as national states. That's from a country perspective. That's a, a nice ending. Um, before I uh, um, thank Yusuf and, uh, and ask for a round of applause, um, I just wanted to make a couple of small announcements. So one thing uh, I was asked to plug is some leaflets here, um, which is an earlier project that myself and Yusuf were involved in on the role of teachers in building peace. Um, which relates to this effective sides of the kind of non-literacy, uh, um, numeracy uh, objectives within the SDGs. Uh, the other announcement is the next um, Sussex Development Lecture is on the 9th of May, which will be Dan Carden, Member of Parliament, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development, on a related subject, why building strong public services is crucial to the SDG agenda. So that will be on uh, May the 9th. Um, I guess the third thing is I just want to thank you for turning up today. Uh, we were a little worried because it's in the break between terms that we wouldn't get an audience and the sun is shining. So thank you very much for all those that attended, both uh, physically and also online. Um, and uh, just a round of applause, I think, for Yusuf for a very informative lecture. Thank you.